the process of endochondral ossification is going to begin with a cartilaginous model. As we can see in this image, this is a hyaline cartilage model of something that looks like it someday will become the humerus. So we're going to call this the soon to be humerus. Okay. Um, as we can see, um, this light blue tissue is, of course, the very consistent gelatinous matrix of the hyaline cartilage. Now, if you look inside, we can see that there is a region that is a little bit darker blue. And so what's happening in this region is calcification. So calcium is binding to this gelatinous matrix, making it even more difficult than it normally is for those chondrocytes living in the lacunae in this region of the soon to be bone to actually get nutrients and oxygen. And so what's going to happen is that these chondrocytes are gonna to start to die off. Okay, leaving behind those big gaping holes that they used to live in, right? So the lacunae are left behind while the chondrocytes are going to start to die in the middle of the cell here. Okay, while this uh, calcification and subsequent uh, mortality of the uh, chondrocytes is going to happen, um, the entire model here is going to grow um, so while all this is occurring, we have growth of the cartilage in both directions. And now remember that endochondral ossification begins at about eight weeks post-fertilization. During that time, we also have a very rapid development of the cardiovascular system. And so very soon, we're going to see that blood vessels um, grow and develop much more um, adjacent to each of our bones. Okay? And so with this blood comes chemicals. It comes hormones that are going to drive the development of this bone. And so in the blood, we have signals that essentially tell the perichondrium, right, that girdle structure that's around the entire cartilaginous model, to change into a periosteum. And so what exactly does that involve? Well, the perichondrium has stem cells that ultimately are going to derive into um, chondroblasts and chondrocytes. The periosteum is going to have those osteogenic stem cells that will become osteoblasts. And so again, the blood is going to tell the stem cells um, pretty much around the diaphysis of the developing bone um, to convert into osteoblasts. As soon as that happens, we then call this the periosteum as opposed to the perichondrium. Okay. Osteoblasts are immediately going to start doing what osteoblasts do. Okay, so right around the perimeter of the cell, just deep to the, now we can call it periosteum, osteoblasts are going to be secreting osteoid, which we know is then spontaneously ossified. Hydroxyapatites are going to latch onto those collagenous fibers and form bone, okay? And so this process is going to happen in kind of a haphazard way. The osteoblasts are really just trying to get bony tissue down in any configuration possible, not in um, nice little lamellae, not in a really organized fashion. Okay, so this is uh, pretty much immature bone, but what it's doing is it's creating essentially a collar of bone around the entire diaphysis. Now this, um, drawing that we have here is a bone or soon to be bone that's cut in half. And so we can see those little, um, little lines of kind of uh, tan tissue. That is the bony color, right? We can only see little slivers, but in fact, this goes around the entire diaphysis of the bone. Okay. Once we have this bony color, Osteoclasts are going to differentiate from those same stem cells in the periosteum, and they are going to essentially spit out their acids, spit out their enzymes, and tunnel a hole through that bony collar that we just made. And so that is important because this bony hole is going to allow a brand new branch of the blood vessel to enter into the diaphysis of the bone. So here we can see the same blood vessel. It is now branched off and now it is entering, bringing blood, bringing nutrients, bringing those signals to differentiate into osteoblasts all the way into the middle of the bone. Okay. This hole sticks around a long time. And in fact, we've seen it before. This is called the nutrient foramen. Okay, so this blood vessel is going to stay there for the rest of your life, and that is what supplies the diaphysis of each one of your long bones. Okay, so um, again, the blood is going to bring um, resources as well as signals 
into the diaphysis of the soon to be bone. Okay, it's going to cause the differentiation of osteoblasts. And just like we've seen so many times before, osteoblasts start cranking out osteoid. It is then ossified. And they're so good at what they do. They trap themselves in the bony matrix that they themselves make. Okay. Unlike intramembranous ossification, in endochondral ossification, we have one single primary ossification center. Remember that in the flat bones, we have lots of little osteoblasts differentiating all around the bones, and then they ultimately spread out and grow together. Here, we start making the bone in the diaphysis, right? So that is the primary ossification center. It starts right in the middle of the bone and then spreads out um, proximally and distally at the same time. Okay, so it spreads along the diaphysis towards both ends. Okay. Um, and so again, this is the laying down of immature or primary bone. We're really just like cranking out lots of collagen, which is ossified to an extent, but it's not super strong yet. Baby bones are still very flexible because they have a greater than 35% organic matrix um, like they would in an adult bone. Okay, so um, as soon as this bone is laid down, osteoclasts are going to come back along, they're going to break it down, and osteoblasts will build it up in that nice lamellar structure. Okay. Um, and so this remodeling process is going to continue. Overall, the activities of the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts are ultimately going to open up the medullary cavity. Okay, so what we can see here is that some bone has been cleared away in the middle and instead stronger, more organized bone um, essentially thickens that bony color, thickens the shell around the diaphysis. Okay, so the osseous tissue of the shaft or the diaphysis is going to thicken, becoming much stronger. Um, of course, we still see that there's cartilage at either epiphysis, right? So we're getting there. Um, but now the medullary cavity is wide open. It is highly vascularized and it is surrounded by strong, ossified, lots of organic matrix um, bone to strengthen the shaft of the bone. Okay. Um, the, the epiphyses, okay? Now that we have a strong diaphysis, now new blood vessels are going to penetrate into um, each of the epiphyses. So we see one here on the proximal side, we see one here on the distal side, okay? Same exact process is happening. Osteoclasts are going to burrow into this bony collar, okay? And a blood vessel is going to branch and deliver oxygen and nutrients inside the epiphysis. Now, both of these are therefore called the secondary ossification centers. Again, different from flat bone development because in a membrane, intramembranous ossification, we have lots of little ossification centers popping up all over. In long bones, number one is in the diaphysis and then the epiphyses um, are ossified next. And so the same process is going to happen, right? We have the differentiation of osteoblasts. They lay down their osteoid, it's ossified. They get trapped, they become osteocytes, right? So if that seems unfamiliar, go back and watch a previous video because that's a really important process. Okay, so the epiphyses are going to be filling with spongy bone, right? Again, it's going to be laid down all disorganized at first and then it'll be remodeled as time goes on, okay? Um, note that the entire epiphysis is not going to be entirely filled with bone. Note that on the surface, on the very end of the epiphysis of the long bone is always going to be cartilage. Okay, so that initial cartilage, that is going to stay. We will then call it articular cartilage. That is going to protect the end of the long bone within the joint. Okay, also note that there is always going to be a little bit of cartilage in between the secondary ossification center and the primary ossification center. Okay? And so this is called the epiphyseal cartilage or the epiphyseal plate, right? It's in the epiphysis, it is cartilage, so it tells us exactly what it does. We more commonly know it as the growth plate. Okay, so these growth plates are so important and you might already be familiar with this because this is where your growth is going to continue throughout your childhood and into your adolescence. Okay, so if we zoom in on this proximal epiphysis, 
um, what we can see is that there are several different steps, several different regions of the same epiphyseal cartilage or growth plate. Okay, so on the epiphyseal side, right, so the top of the bone, what we have is um, essentially the growth of more cartilage. Right? In order for endochondral ossification to continue, we need to have a cartilaginous scaffold or structure onto which we can actually build the bone. Again, this is not conversion of cartilage into bone. This is just a scaffold. We need some kind of a shape to guide the activity of the osteoblasts. Okay, so we need to make more cartilage up here. Okay, so what we can see here is um, cartilage cells are going to divide, right? So they're going to undergo mitosis and this process is going to allow more cells to secrete more and more cartilage matrix. Okay. Um, the, just like we saw initially in the primary ossification center, the cartilage is going to start calcifying, okay, which leads to the death of those chondrocytes trapped in the lacunae. Okay, so this here would start to calcify, making it even more difficult for these poor cells to get any blood, any kind of resources whatsoever. And so they're going to die, leaving these big old holes, right? These lacunae empty, okay? So on the epiphyseal side and on the top of the growth plate, we're making more cartilage, okay? On the diaphyseal side, um, we have uh, chondrocytes dying, leaving behind these holes, right? And there, uh, or then we have osteoblasts, which differentiate from stem cells due to signals in the blood that are going to be laying down their osteoid, getting trapped, building new spongy or immature bone here. Okay, so um, again, just like we saw with um, the primary ossification center, these osteoblasts can kind of move into these lacunae. They can lay down their own matrix, which is then ossified. Okay, so what we see is that uh, essentially growth is going to continue, right? So we keep on laying down layer after layer after layer of cartilage over here, while all of this stuff on the shaft side is essentially uh, replaced by bone. So your osteoblasts are coming along here. They are moving up the diaphysis, okay, to replace this cartilage, right, with new bone. And so if we look at some histology here, we can actually break this process down even a little bit more. Um, here we have the proliferation zone where we're actively building more cartilage, right? Chondroblasts are secreting proteoglycans, making this matrix, trapping themselves in lacunae. Um, hypertrophy, right? Chondrocytes, right? Previous chondrocytes that used to build cartilage are going to be kind of, uh, well, the, they're going to start to die, right? So they enlarge, they signal the surrounding matrix to start calcifying. This calcification is then going to uh, trigger the chondrocytes to die, okay? Leaving behind these big open spaces, okay? So these big open spaces here are the lacunae in which uh, the chondrocytes used to live, but it's not yet bone, right? This is just calcified cartilage, right? Now, the ossification zone is where essentially these osteoblasts are going to replace that cartilaginous matrix with ossified tissue, with bone itself, right? They secrete osteoid, it is then ossified, making bone, and of course, surrounding themselves in this bone. And then the osteoblasts are then renamed as osteocytes once they are trapped in their own lacunae. Okay, so um, again, we can break this down. We are growing up in this direction, right? Cartilage cells are dying here, leaving behind holes or leaving behind space that is then going to be, interesting, uh, that is then going to be um, replaced by bone. Again, replaced, not converted, okay? Um, so over time, um, a bone that was this long, right, is now going to have built more cartilage here, right, replaced cartilage on this side, right, and so the entire end of the bone, the entire epiphysis is going to move 
up, right? So essentially we are lengthening the diaphysis, pushing the epiphysis farther and farther away from the diaphysis. Okay. Um, and of course, this is happening in both directions, right? So we've just been looking at moving proximally, but this process is also occurring in the distal epiphysis. So bones grow up and they grow down at the same time. You have two epithelial plates in each of your long bones. Okay. Um, so essentially, uh, this is a game of like chase of like cat and mouse, right? The chondroblasts are building cartilage and then the osteoblasts are replacing it down here. And for the most part, when you're a kid, these cells are keeping pace with each other, right? Like osteoblasts are always a little bit ahead and the chondroblasts, they're kind of doing their thing at approximately the same rate. Now this changes when you hit puberty. Um, of course, when you hit puberty, uh, you have a drastic spike in sex steroids and sex steroids essentially ramp up the activity of osteoblasts. Okay, so chondroblasts are still going to be going along at the same pace they always have, growing the cartilage up and down at the same time. But now the osteoblasts are supercharged, right? They have a jolt of estrogen, they have a jolt of testosterone, and all of a sudden they are going to hurry up so much so that eventually they are going to catch up to those chondroblasts. Now, as soon as there is no more cartilage left to replace by bone, as soon as there's no more cartilage model left, all of a sudden, there's no more bone formation. Okay, so once the chondroblasts, um, or once the osteoblasts catch up to the chondroblasts, right, so now there's no more cartilage. Essentially, this is the closing of the growth plates. Okay? Um, so the epiphyseal cartilage is going to narrow down, right, particularly after puberty when, you know, your height spikes, right, um, and so this process is called epiphyseal closure, okay, leaving behind something that we've seen before, and that is the epiphyseal line. Okay, so it's a scar of what used to be your epiphyseal plate or your growth plate. And again, this closure is usually triggered by a spike in sex steroids. Um, oftentimes, or there are a lot of other hormones that are going to regulate this process, of course, growth hormone, thyroid hormone, those types of things. Um, but what really ramps it up at the end there is, uh, is puberty. Okay. And so usually you stop growing off for the most part, um, a few years after puberty, um, particularly in females, um, after uh, puberty starts, it's about three years tops until you stop growing. Okay. Um, I do want to point out this x-ray up here. Um, all right, here is uh, the end of a long bone, right? And so I want to point out that this here is your growth plate. Okay, so your epiphyseal plate is here. Um, and so when you get an x-ray, you can actually see, um, you know, approximately how big these growth plates are and therefore estimate how much longer you have to grow. Okay. Um, also, this process is happening in each one of your long bones. Okay, so of course we can think about, you know, our arm bones, our leg bones, they're of course long bones, but also each and every one of your phalanges is also going through this process. So we can see growth plate, growth plate, growth plate in each one. And now your growth plates close um, at different points, okay, at different ages for the most part. Um, of course, I said that, you know, on average, you have a few years after puberty, but some of these bones actually keep growing for quite some time. And so what this image is showing you here is the, uh, the range of ages that the epiphyseal plates completely shut down. Um, and so on um, your feet, right, 12 to 22 years of age, right? Um, so of course, this depends on when you hit puberty and your genetics and all of these different uh, factors, but um, fairly wide range, right? If you look at them, most of them are, you know, soon after puberty starts. Um, there are some, however, that uh, take a little while. Um, look at your clavicles, right? Your clavicles might not stop growing until you are 30 years old. All right, so it is very possible that you guys are still growing, even though that seems that, you know, that must have stopped a long time ago, but um, to a small extent, your bones may still be growing and therefore, um, you know, whatever you put into your body is still very important um, to the growth process. Okay, so that is all for 
or actually, um, we'll talk about um, appositional bone growth here. Um, third and final type of bone growth that I want to talk about, um, appositional bone growth is when bones grow in diameter, right? So endochondral, they're growing in length. Appositional is growing in girth. Of course, we don't want our adult bones to be as skinny as our child bones were, right? So the entire time we have bones growing in length, we also have a remodeling process, right? And actually expansion of the bone out um, in the horizontal direction as well, right? So as, um, as your bone is growing in length, essentially your osteoclasts are breaking down bone in the medullary cavity, okay? And your osteoblasts are laying down new bony tissue around the perimeter, right? So these would be osteo blasts in the periosteum. They are laying down new bony tissue, lamella after lamella after lamella. So making it wider and wider and wider. But of course we have to open up that medullary cavity on the inside too. And so as a young adult, you're still growing in length. We lay down more layers around the outside. Okay? And the inside is carved out by osteoclasts. Okay. Um, ultimately your adult bones should be uh, fairly broad, right, um, and have a very big medullary cavity for that uh, yellow bone marrow to reside. And so we can see um, we can see evidence of appositional bone growth or appositional deposition um, in our adult bones, and we've actually seen these structures before. Um, we know that cylinders made up of lots of lamellae are called osteons, but all the way around the perimeter of the cells are a couple more of these lamellae. And these are called circumferential lamellae. They go around the circumference of the entire bone. And essentially this is showing us that these stem cells have differentiated into osteoblasts, right? Those osteoblasts have laid down layer after layer after layer. And so here are two new layers that didn't exist over here. And so again, that is just these cells laying down more bony tissue right deep to the periosteum. Okay. Note that intermembranous ossification starts with a membrane. We need a mesenchyme membrane. Endochondral ossification starts with hyaline cartilage. We need cartilage first. Appositional growth can only happen on existing bones. Okay, so intermembranous needs a membrane. Endochondral needs cartilage. Appositional needs an existing bone. You can't just make a bone out of nowhere. Appositional requires the bone to already exist. Okay, in the next uh, segment, uh, you will hear about how all of these processes work together to remodel and repair the bones.